como que no, no. All right. All right. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to our live off script from Pittsburgh. Uh, uh, TCG conference. We've done these live uh, versions of our podcast for some years, going back to Portland, D.C., uh, St. Louis, and um, uh, Miami. So we're happy to be here in Pittsburgh, um, and you know, to get a crash course in Pittsburgh theater and in the, the arts. Um, I'm Rob Weiner Kent. I'm the editor in chief of American Theater. Uh, my pronouns are he/him, and I'm here with my colleague Alexander Pearson. I'm the associate editor of American Theater, and my pronouns are she, her. Um, this is the entire staff of American Theater, <laughs> which is something we'll talk about at our, at, our, at, our lunch, at our lunch with American Theater after this. That's, that's the 1 p.m. We'll hear more about the magazine. But this is not about the magazine. This is about Pittsburgh. So I'm really honored to have with us uh, the, the, the leading drama critic and, and, and uh, reporter for Pittsburgh, Sharon Eberson. She was a, a former sports writer. In fact, she told me she was the first woman covering sports at a Pittsburgh paper. Was a milestone. Um, a, for, a theater and entertainment editor, was the theater critic for the P Pittsburgh Post Gazette, and now is a co-editor of OnStagePittsburgh.com. So, Sharon, welcome to Offscript. Tell us a little bit about we were talking about earlier um, about uh, specifically OnStagePittsburgh.com. Why that started, but then we'll talk more about the Pittsburgh scene. Uh, hi, it's great to be here. Um, Sharon Everson, pronouns she/her. Uh, thank you for having me. Uh, Pittsburgh uh, is a theater town. Um, I'm hoping that you're all getting to know that as, as yeah. Um, I'm hoping that uh, you're all getting to know that you can tell I'm not a performer, right? Um, and I write. I, I'm not a broadcaster. Uh, and I worked for the Pittsburgh Post Gazette, which from the '90s till today is the most prominent uh, mainstream media in town. Uh, and they. Um, at some point decided performing arts was not as important to them as it had been, and that was uh, uh, an hour through the heart, and I left at a specific time uh, during the pandemic, uh, and uh, someone who was also concerned about it uh, got in touch with me, and we created a website. It's a startup. It's called onstagepittsburgh.com, as you said, and professionals are uh, covering as much as we can of Pittsburgh theater from uh, community theater uh, to the, the uh, Pittsburgh Cultural Trust tours that come through. So um, yeah, that's what we're up to right now. Great. I wanted to go, go back and so how are you a Pittsburgh native, Sharon? Or? No, I'm from Brooklyn, okay. um, but right. I came here when I was 22. Okay, so, work, so you've yeah. had some time here. And, and, yeah. And you covered, uh, can you give us a sense of your sense of Pittsburgh and how it's, how it's changed as a city and as an art, arts destination? Well, Pittsburgh is a big, small town. I've heard a lot of people mm. describe it that way, and, and that's, you know, it's cosmopolitan, but obviously it's not New York City, so uh, it has that. Uh, and not a lot has changed in terms of, you know, the arts since I've been here, um, other than it just keeps growing. One of the things it has going for it is, uh, besides a very traditional base of foundation support, uh, you know, the Fricks, the Mellons, the Carnegies, they started here. Um, but uh, there are two universities, uh, the most prominent universities maybe in drama and dance uh, in the country or among those, Carnegie Mellon and Point Park. And not only do they produce um, great uh, artists, but it gives artists a way to stay here and support themselves too as, okay. as teachers and instructors. I think that's a really big part of what helps us maintain uh, uh, the uh, great artists that we have here. We, we were just talking, um, uh, Cotter Smith is among several actors I can name who's fairly prominent. If you saw him, you'd know who he is. Yeah. Um, and. Um, he came here uh, to do work, to film something, and decided he loved it. Uh, he left uh, a teaching position at Pace, and uh, you know he came here, and um, and he lives here now. It's his base. Really? Yes. Okay. Um, and 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 he's not the only one. Tim McGeever is someone I, I bring up, um, who uh, 
like you did the national tour of uh, The Lion King is Zazu. And okay. he came here for work, mm -hmm. and he has never left. His wife is also a, um, an actor. So, you know, there are people who uh, come here, and they see our artistic community and are so taken with it. It's expansive. You know, uh, the Pittsburgh Cultural Trust is an $85 million entity consider, uh, with lots of real estate uh, and other things. Mm -hmm. um, and then um, down to uh, our small theaters, our community theaters, our immersive theaters, our environmental theaters, which you'll get to hear about a little bit here. Uh, we, we, um, we are wide range. If, if you love new theater, if you like traditional theater, you can find it here. You find a wide range. It, mm -hmm. it also strikes me geographically that it's not, like the Philly scene is, pretty, is close enough to New York that there's a bit of exchange there with, with mm -hmm. people. That's not the case here. There's, there's not another major arts-centered super close. I mean, so like Chicago, it's sort of on its own building its own, own I, art. I would say that, you know, Cleveland is, is a hop, skip, and a jump That's right, away. that's right. The people from Ohio did, did drive a lot of and, them. And, so. and West Virginia, um, too, has some of it. But yes, yeah. we, we are a center, and people come to us. I, I would say that that's, uh, especially uh, for national tours. And once you've seen our cultural district and gotten to know it, uh, I hear that people do come back. Um, we'll get into this a bit more when we talk to the, to the theater leaders, but could you talk a little bit about how the last couple of years have been for the art scene. I think you told me that no theaters had, uh, you know, had to close or. We lost shows, and we actually right. recently, um, very heartbreakingly, lost uh, the last uh, weekend of a show due to COVID. Um, that uh, again, a small theater. They do a mix of professional and amateur. It's called Front Porch Theatricals. They do two musicals a year. They did the very little done Man of No Importance, which, by the way, is going to be John Doyle's last uh, his going away production at Classic Stage, right. and they did it here with um, uh, the blessing of Stephen Flaherty, who's from Dormont, local boy. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, it was a lovely production, and we lost that. Uh, I, I'll say that um, it was really interesting covering things and and the words we used. There were it was. So long before I stopped writing about what we lost, instead of writing about uh, quantum theater, Carla Booz's uh, quantum theater coming back with um, a current war, which was you know a new, a new production, uh, and only the way they can do it. Mm -hmm. um, and but I still for a while was using the word pivot constantly, yeah, pivot, right. you know, um, <laughs> and how wonderfully all the theaters here did try to do different things. And that was wonder that was in a way really cool to see um, and to see them move outdoors or to see people work with married couples. We have a lot of <laughs> married couples who are artists, you know, in things we did online. Uh, and, you know, it, it just was uh, interesting to see what everyone was doing next. Lots of seminars and webinars, uh, that sort of thing. Uh, but when I stopped using uh, what we lost and talked about what we've gained and talked and stop talking about pivoting and, and saying here is a production, that, that was just a very heartwarming uh, time. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, one of the most, uh, Martha Graham is from Pittsburgh, I guess, originally. Yes, uh -huh. But one of the most famous uh, artists, obviously, is August Wilson. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting, the relationship of Pittsburgh to August Wilson, it's obviously his work, but it's not where he made his, made his work, mostly. And he didn't live, live here after a certain point. But there's, a, there's obviously a huge embrace of his work, and it's inspired a lot of, of you know, a whole center across the street, but also uh, artists, you know. Oh, well, uh, right now is sort of the height of our realizing, you know, this treasure that uh, we have and, and uh, paying tribute to it. Uh, yeah. If you haven't been to the center to see a writer's landscape, yeah. which is an amazing exhibition to take you through his work, and the August Wilson House was very belatedly named a national landmark and will soon open as a center in the Hill District, which is what he wrote about. Yeah, August Wilson um, uh, lived here for what you think is a relatively short time in his youth, but uh, he wrote about it for the rest of his life, living yeah. in, uh, working at Yale or in Minnesota or in Seattle. Yeah. Uh, it, it made such an impression. And it uh, doesn't necessarily reflect well on Pittsburgh. Um, <laughs> it, it, you know, it, a lot of, uh, uh, Two Trains Running, which is just uh, finishing up the public theater, is about um, the 
what urban renewal does to um, uh, certain communities, uh, and that's a continuing problem in Pittsburgh. Uh, uh, but um, we've been uh, lucky enough that there are people who care to preserve his work. Uh, Montez uh, Freeland, who's with us, is, he's worked a lot with Pittsburgh Playwrights Theater, uh, mm -hmm. and I th they're on their second uh, go around through the cycle, uh, the American Century Cycle, which we here in Pittsburgh call the Pittsburgh Cycle. Um, <laughs> <laughs> only one play is set in Chicago, and it's all sure. indoors, so, and, and it was filmed here. Uh, and, um, really? Yeah. Uh, I didn't know that. So, um, Denzel Washington, who is a major contributor to, uh, to the August Wilson House, uh, is uh, he made a commitment that uh, as he does the as he produces the cycle uh, that they as many as he can uh, of the plays will be filmed here um, for okay uh, that's great uh, so the first two Venzes and Ma Rainey and uh, Samuel L Jackson is bringing the piano lesson back to yes, uh, yes. to Broadway and my understanding is it'll be filmed here too that's great I know that. Um, I just thought of Radio Golf as, as a black mayor in it, I believe, right? Mm -hmm. And that was prophetic because we just we just finally have one, right? Yes, how um, exciting. Yeah. Um, so I wanted to also now introduce uh, uh, the artists we have with us today, artists and leaders uh, from Pittsburgh. Um, Montez Freeland, you might have heard at the previous panel. And if you're from Pittsburgh, you definitely know his work. He's a co-artist director of City Theater. He's a Baltimore native. We'll talk a little bit about that. Um, he graduated from Point Park University, uh, the Conservative Performing Arts. I'll just go through a few credits. He was named the Pittsburgh post Gazette's Performer of the Year in 2017. He's multi-hyphenate, as is Carla. Uh, he's directed for Pittsburgh Playwrights Theater Company, Prime Stage, Kuntu Rep, CLO Summer Academy, City Theater. As a playwright, I love these titles. His original musical, Calopsia, J.H. Mechanics of a Legend, Santa's TED Talk, and Fishy Woo Woo. Uh, <laughs> he's also produced an artistic associate with the Pittsburgh Playwrights Theater. Um, and then also with us is Carla Booz, who founded Quantum Theater uh, what, 32 years ago, 22 years ago, uh, as an experimental theater that does not work in one space, um, works site specifically around Pittsburgh, all over the place. Uh, Booz frequently directs, uh, less frequently performs, although she's now in rehearsal for Cherry Orchard in, as Run of Sky, I imagine. Yes? Okay. Uh, recent projects, well, this is an old bio, but projects include the Baroque Pastiche Winner's Tale at the, in the Union Trust Building. All the names adapted from Jose Saramago's novel uh, at the Northside Carnegie Library. Uh, I think a big focus of, of her work has been championing the work of other mid-sized performance companies. Um, Pittsburgh does seem to have that uh, tradition. So uh, Montez, Carla, it's wonderful to have you. I want to just ask you about some of the talks, things we're talking about. What, what, uh, what's it been like in Pittsburgh the past couple years? <laughs> Well, uh, thank you for having me and us. Um, I'm a transplant to Pittsburgh, so I grew up in Baltimore, and I'm a student of the Arena Players, uh, which is the oldest continuously run African-American community theater in the country. And so I started there when I was uh, seven or eight years old, and I stayed until I was 18, then they put you out, <laughs> and um, hoping that you go on to bigger and better things. And so uh, coming to Pittsburgh uh, for uh, college, uh, going to Point Park University, was um, a highlight as it expanded my mind away from Baltimore and looking into theater as more of a um, universal world. And uh, you know, coming from a very homogenous place of, of black culture, coming to Pittsburgh, I had to seek it out had to find it. And luckily, I found two people who were so instrumental to me as a person, but also as an artist. And those are Dr. Vernell Lilly and Mark Clayton Southers. And they both took me under their wing and said, uh, let's figure this out. Let's make some of your dreams a reality. Very plainly, very openly, and very deliberately and putting my name next to theirs on you know, monikers and on <laughs> playbills. And uh, that was the spark for me to be able to um, eventually be uh, what I hope to be a community leader, not just in theater, but looking holistically at some of the challenges that face Pittsburgh. Uh, but right now I'm starting with theater <laughs> because that's what I know and eventually hoping to expand beyond that. But. Um, but the theater community here is loyal, it's rich, it's uh, full of life and support. It um, opens, it holds the door open for new people. 
you hear a lot of times in other cities that uh, there's a hard, people have a hard time breaking in. I think we actually embrace new artists here in Pittsburgh. When they get here, we're excited about their talent. We're excited about what they can bring to our community. And uh, we hold those doors open. Of course, there's more work to do, but we have a breadth of theater that allows for that to happen on many different levels. Fine, thank you. I made it from rehearsal across the city that has road closures for Juneteenth parades. Yes, you know, but I made it. Um, gosh, I just really want to piggyback on some things that my beautiful colleagues have said. Um, I want to say that journalism is such so important to our artistic present and our evolution. The publication that Sharon, that brought Sharon to Pittsburgh, her former uh, senior guy in theater criticism, Chris Rawson, who is known to American theater, I'm sure, you know, really was instrumental in um, providing global context and an informed opinion that is completely connected to the success of my company, Quantum Theater, 32 years old. I founded it to be experimental in this city, which was not necessarily a place where experimental theater could thrive. You know, journalism is still so important. Um, I want to piggyback on Montez and his, his, his uh, comments that we feel connected. Uh, it's a really little known fact, but I'm talking about it more in these days that we are all in the present, in the theater, the spiritual brothers and sisters of August Wilson. In 1990, when I was incredibly young and wanted to start a theater in Pittsburgh, I sought August Wilson and found him in the Crawford Grill and talked to him. I was no one from nowhere about my idea to start a theater. And that man extended his generous spirit and it was instrumental. And so he is not kidding when he says, we have a tradition of embracing people for, in my experience, 30 years. Um, and we love our differences and we love a kind of collegiality that makes all boats rise. I want to kind of counter Sharon, who is, you know, from the day that I'm from, in that um, not much has changed but growth in Pittsburgh in the last 30 years. I think there's actually been a lot of change. I think there's been a lot of reflecting of change in general and a sort of, um, you know, in my, in my, I make work that's global and interdisciplinary, which is uh, everybody does now, right? You know, but 30 years ago, <laughs> not so. So I think we have reflected uh, trends that are not American, but um, you know, about how technology informs things. Our university is so key to it over the last 30 years. You know, so all these things together make this a really great theater town. And my company, Quantum Theater, is an example of what can come of it. I would say. Well, speaking of quantum, I'm hoping you can tell me a little bit of the, some of the challenges and some of the benefits of making site-specific theater. Sure. Um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm going to use this platform to say we are an experimental company. Environmental theater making is one of our experiments, the one that has become most notable, easiest to grasp. You know, I'm making an opera directed by Claire Von Kampen, who's married to Mark Rylance, you know, a former co-artistic leader of the Globe Theater. It's going to be in the Biome Theater and star the greatest Baroque singers of our present. So that's not something you would have guessed, right? You think steel mills and you think, you know, we just experiment on every level, but the environmental thing stuck and it's beautiful and it, it allows you to express the layers of a community. It allows you to engage with the layers of a community and be, be in the moment as well as the past of your city in your art making. And it enables you to connect your audience to the many, many communities of your town. So 
it's great. Lots of people do it now. Not so much 30 years ago. And um, Pittsburgh is a city that's really provided an endless source of um, inspiration for that. I, speaking of uh, sort of environmental, uh, I, I think City Theater did as a drive-in uh, situation. Can you tell us a little bit about that, Montez, and how, how maybe how that was one of your adaptations to the pandemic, right? Yes. Um, this was around, I would say, late summer of 2020. And uh, we had, you know, come to the understanding that we would not be able to produce a season inside as everyone sort of had to swallow that difficult pill. Maybe right. not Carla, but, um, <laughs> but, but everyone in the city sort of had that um, observation. And so um, this was born out of uh, two things. One, how do we create programming for our audience, an audience that missed theater dearly? But then also, how did we serve our community of artists who had not had the opportunity to perform at that point over for over about six months? And so we came up with the Drive-In Arts Festival that didn't necessarily have uh, traditional theater components to it, as you would think with city theater. I would think there was like actually only one night in which people uh, performed spoken word. Um, but we engaged artists, uh, different musicians from around the community, from One Hood uh, Media to the Pittsburgh Symphony Orchestra, uh, Texture Ballet for dance, um, in addition to some of the you know, stalwarts in jazz, uh, working with MCG Jazz as well. Uh, we even had a magician, and we had a disco dance activism uh, group, activist group as well. And so what it did, we uh, broke out of the South Side and went to, I was about to say Hartwood Acres, that's not what we're, Hazelwood Green. And uh, so we went into a new community, which was uh, different for city theater. We are good about going into communities and bringing them to our productions. But to go into a community meant that we couldn't just plop down there. We had to get to know its residents, its businesses, so that we could point our audiences to go to those restaurants so that we could uh, work with different community, like, like community kitchen to potentially provide um, safe food for our patrons who wanted to know where the concessions were. <laughs> and, um, you know, so it was an opportunity for us to expand as a company, mm -hmm. meet the moment, meet the community. And every artist who walked off stage said that was my first time performing in months. And uh, it was different because as opposed to applause, they had uh, cars honking their horns at them. Mm. And so it was a very different experience. But uh, not only did we um, do the three-week arts festival, but we kicked it off with a production of F seventh grade. I don't know the content warnings here. No, but, you can uh, say whatever you want, yeah. <laughs> so we did uh, <laughs> Fuck 7th Grade by Jill Sabil. Uh, oh, yeah. Because it's a great title, right? Because yeah. Fuck 7th Grade. <laughs> and so um, we did a yeah. more of a concert version of that and filmed it and was able to put that into the ho household okay. of our patrons. And <laughs> then nice. we also had Manuel uh, Cinema's Frankenstein, which we were supposed to produce on stage. And so we actually put them right on our stage in Hazelwood Green. So we ran for about at the end of summer to the top of fall. We were out there in shorts at the beginning, and we were wrapped up in coats at the end. And so <laughs> it was a great opportunity to service our community, right. to learn. It was uh, incredibly uh, a big undertaking for our staff and for our team, but we rose to the occasion. Yeah. As a father of a seventh grader, I think I can second the, that title. Um, <laughs> I. Uh, I wanted to just follow up on one, one thing about that, Montez, and this might be applicable also to the racial justice uh, 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 conversation that's been going on. In the case, a lot of theaters adapted the pandemic with outdoor performance or virtual, and they did it, and now, now they're back in their theaters, and you know, and everything's not back, quite back to normal, as you know, but things are more like they were. Um, can you talk about the things you learned about going out in the community? Are you, you going to take with you? Are you going to continue to do some of these programs? Maybe not drive-in, maybe not uh, you know, virtual plays or whatever, but do you feel like there's, there's learnings you took from the pandemic that you will, are part of city, part of the city DNA? 100%. Of okay. course, the collaboration and partnerships. Uh, in the last year, our entire season, every production, we've partnered or collaborated with another entity, either uh, locally or nationally, 
to produce the productions, whether it was the Pittsburgh CLO, uh, MCG Jazz. Um, we also partnered with City Company coming into town, Universes as well, um, looking at the uh, sanitation department locally to partner with, um, looking at Pittsburgh Playhouse and Point Park University. These were sort of ideas in the past and touch points in the past, but now they are becoming the bedrock of our company. It is important that we collaborate. It's important that we share resources to, uh, we're all working to get the same audience to a degree. You know, it's the people of Pittsburgh that we would like to come see our shows. And if we're in this deficit of uh, audience, then I think it is important for us to rally together and see how we can connect, where there are differences, where there are things alike. And um, so going into another community, we were cautious. We knew that, it, we know that it takes not just, we're coming to your area, let's set up shop. It takes a trust. It takes an understanding that we're not going to abuse their product or their resources and that we're going to replenish uh, inside of the community, not just with our art, but with our physical dollars, with our uh, physical bodies being in their spaces, not to make an announcement and leave, but to actually go to that space and to listen to what they're saying, to sit in community kitchen and to talk with the people there and not just in the office with the folks who are saying, you can do this. So uh, those tenants, I think, are now becoming some of the bedrocks and core values of city theater moving forward. Yeah, um, speaking of being engaged with the community, I'm really curious about the social justice response to you know the murder of George Floyd and the We See You White American Theater document and and all of those you know important influences. How has Pittsburgh responded? Well, it, it's been interesting to watch. I, I wanted to piggyback first on on what Montez was saying, and I think this leans into that um, quantum theater when it goes into a community. They always partner with local restaurants. I mean, they, they don't, I don't think there's a theater that goes out into the community that doesn't, in Pittsburgh, you know, doesn't make that a point of getting, you know, uh, embedding themselves there and letting their patrons know that this is a place that you're coming into where there are these other things happening too. And, and the spirit of, of cooperation here is amazing. Really quickly, uh, just this past uh, week, um, there's a small theater called Kinetic Theater that's at City Theater. There was a problem, I know, um, I don't know if it was COVID related or not, where they couldn't get their sets up where they thought they were. Pittsburgh Playwrights Theater came in, built their sets, hauled them and put them up. And this is the kind of cooperation that, that you see here in, in Pittsburgh, and I'm sure in, in other smaller towns too. So you know, there was a giant immersive several years ago uh, maybe Carla can talk about too a little bit uh, that involved just a ton of theaters here that got together and, and created this huge thing in a downtown building, a walkthrough, like sleep no more, that sort of thing. So I think that uh, when uh, George Floyd happened, Black Theater United um, came into being, uh, this was a conversation that uh, was a long time coming, maybe was... Uh, in the shadows and people were talking about it, but there also had been a, uh, a gathering here and Montez was a part of it uh, and uh, Deal Mensor and some other people you might've seen here about hiring practices here in Pittsburgh. Um, we're not perfect like any city uh, and uh, where theaters got together. Uh, uh, Greg Douglas, who's uh, now in D.C., was was one of the leaders. Uh, Deep Tran came in, and um, she uh, uh, hosted this uh, discussion about hiring practices, and it uh, centered around uh, a production of Anna in the Tropics, uh, where uh, uh, Latino actors had to drop out, and they were going to hire non-Latino actors to replace them, and uh, that production was closed down. And, and so this is a, a, a conversation that uh, was happening and continues to happen. Uh, n nothing is perfect. Uh, people are trying, um, but I think everyone is learning as they go along uh, here 
and uh, from the universities on up. Uh, there's uh, the fact that they're having the conversations, I think, uh, matters. But uh, yeah, there's still a uh, long ways to go. And I think uh, everybody here would want to maybe say something about that. So. Um, I'll just add that in Pittsburgh uh, specifically, it was there. Young people galvanized in the streets. That not only was there national violence that was happening, there was local violence happening, and um, young people, Antoine Rhodes and beyond, who had been uh, who had suffered from police brutality, and in a city that is at segregated and has its pockets of racism and uh, white supremacy stamped all around it, the young people went into the streets and they did exactly as they had been doing all across the country. So there was no difference there. But inside of the theaters, there was a sort of reckoning and calling out of practices that we all understood were sometimes happening and that some people didn't realize the true ramifications of it. Some theater companies decided to face it head on. Some theater companies have not said a word. And so it was important that, as Sharon said, a lot of these conversations were happening sort of internally and bubbling, but now there was agency to speak up and speak out about it. I'm still you know, excited about what can come from those conversations. We have not solved every problem. I don't think anyone expects us to at this point and immediately. But um, the call to action inside of companies, I can speak only for city. Well, I can speak for city theater and Pittsburgh playwrights um, for both that uh, decided to first, you know, to financially support people of color, uh, to put money into the pockets of people of color, acknowledging the disparity and the history of disparity of payment to people of color and then to look inside and see what practices they could change. Uh, Pittsburgh Playwrights, we started a uh, ground up theater, which allowed for free theater training for uh, people of color in Pittsburgh to allow them other companies like Quantum and, and uh, City Theater and beyond in the public who are saying, we're making these commitments to make sure that we hire diverse uh, candidates for positions. Well, we also want to make sure that those diverse candidates are set up for success. And so the second that we announced Ground Up, Carla reached out and said, we want those people. When you're, you know, when we want to help. We want to join in. So once again, there was their collaboration under the umbrella of how do we protect, enable, and lift up uh, people of color uh, in this city, specifically with the purpose of making sure that they are within safe environments and feel valued. We can't, you know, there's a whole nother beast when it comes to the brutality and the uh, instances like George Floyd. But I think if we all work inside of our individual you know, components and you know, containers to do the work that we can do, then the work is happening all over. I'm, I'm happy to, uh, yeah, you know, we are a company that hasn't felt it was right to speak publicly about what we were doing. Um, but I'm happy to, I'm happy to in this environment say that um, we have a staff member who I, I kind of wish was at the mic right now, you know, who had been on the front line of activism. So supporting her was the first thing that we thought we could do. And then internally, you know, we thought we should lean into um, the artists who we knew and had relationships with who might take greater leadership even as we behind the scenes, not publicly, because it doesn't feel right, you know, to me, uh, but lean into this, the condition of our city where there are ever more artists who feel not only welcome, but empowered to enrich our organizations at every level. Anyway, at this point, um, 18 months, Later, we have new leaders on the artistic front, and we've been a company that has, um, you know, really been under my leadership on the artistic side, uh, who are developing projects. We thought that maybe that program for developing projects would 
be distinct and we quickly put something under development on our schedule for next season. It's The Devil is a Lie by Jennifer Chang, directed by Kyle Hayden, right? You know, so we're learning, we're feeling our way in terms of what our role is to engage with this issue. Um, we're grateful that we have people who feel it is their personal mission in our among our colleagues and can look to them for leadership and support. And yeah, there's more to do. I do want to add that, you know, that action versus the sort of lip service. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, because, I mean, you know, it's the action that's married with that. Because uh, you can't just say it. You have to do it. Mm -hmm. And it is important. Like, you know, some people, sometimes you have to clean up inside of your house before you can open the door and invite <laughs> people in. You know? <laughs> and so at least that's how I, I was raised. And so yeah, I think that there's value in that. And there's a purpose in that. And there's... Um, you know, we should be looking at those companies as well who are actually doing that work inside from the ground up and making sure that those who are coming into your space know that that work is happening. So I'm grateful that that was going on at Quanta. I wanted to ask you, Carla, about uh, specifically about Cherry Orchard. This is a play that seems to be popular right now. There was the Wilma production. There's the one at the Barishnikov. Barishnikov. Right yeah, yeah, I get an email like, so, Cherry Orchard, Barishnikov. <laughs> <laughs> I think I'll just slip my wrist now. So, so <laughs> no. So, tell me tell me about yours, and also tell me about, is it One Valley is the name of the place you're doing? Yeah, yeah. It, it is Hazelwood Green. It's like a little okay. subset, sub thing of Hazelwood Green. So it's cool that I'm in Hazelwood right now, you know, yeah. too. But yeah, I haven't acted in 10 years. I'm, I am an actress by training, but, uh, you know, a, a director by chutzpah <laughs> of some 25 years, so much more experienced, I guess, ultimately at directing than acting. And, yeah, it's, um, it's a trip, but uh, it's a lot of fun. And the cherry orchard does feel very relevant. Mm. You know, it's a, mm -hmm. I mean, it's relevant in my personal life because I'm of an age where I go oh, I know I represent the past, and oh, I'm not really dealing well with the future, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but I think, I think the timeless thing of Chekhov is, is really registering with me about how this moment is bigger than me personally. Mm -hmm. It's really about a society that, I, you know, I have a 30-year-old daughter, so it's my personal conversations, too. Mm -hmm. uh, we... We were so well intentioned, and we screwed up so badly. And uh, please take from us. Please be generous. That's one of my lines. Be a little generous. <laughs> you know, I find myself saying that to my my daughter, and um, because we were well intentioned, but uh, it's yours. It's yours to figure out, right? Right. Yeah. Right. I gotta ask: Is are we gonna? It's an, since, since it's outdoors, are we gonna hear actual trees chopping at the end? And the spoiler. Well, you're going to hear trains because okay. Pittsburgh, yeah. there's no outdoor show we've ever done that hasn't had trains for anyone that knows any quantum. Sharon's nodding away. Um, there will be a beautiful melding of the real and the theatrical. All right. All right. I, I, this immersive thing you brought up, uh, Sharon, I'm so curious what, what that was. You, Montes, were you part of that as well? Or Sharon, you want to tell me about it? What was that? that Carla, I lost my, my um, the title uh, downtown. That the, the 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 big immersive um, downtown and the former uh, uh, sports club um, that everybody worked on. Oh, uh, the very first one. It was on the cover of American Theatre magazine by Bricolage. Yes. By oh, Bricolage. Yes. 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 I've lost my mind too. Oh yeah. We'll, we'll come to that. I should know it was point. on the cover of my right. magazine, but it uh, was a long time ago. <laughs> uh, it, it was, you know, a uh, room to room sort of thing. They've yeah. they've uh, they moved on to do things at at the uh, Carnegie Museum after hours that took you through the entire museum. And uh, Bricolage also worked with Real Time Interventions. If you, any of you were in that uh, that group uh, recently, to do um, the uh, Saints tour through Braddock. Uh, it, we, you can get into all the communities around Pittsburgh if you follow the theaters. Uh, it was Strata, certainly. was it? Strata. 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 Thank you. Thank Internet. you so much. <laughs> yes, thank you. I'm so sorry. Um, 
there are, there are just a lot of titles running around in my head, um, which speaks to uh, all the theater that goes on. This weekend alone, I'm missing three performances I, re I really want to see, but I'll see three. So I feel, feel um, good about that. Um, and I'm hoping uh, so much of people who have never been to Pittsburgh before get, are getting to see some of that. So Strata was just an empty building downtown uh, that a bunch of people got together and said, you know, let's do something different and have people walk through from room to room and at the end uh, talk about their experiences. And uh, it was uh, futuristic, it was weird, it was cool, it was all those things and uh, certainly took us out of our seats and uh, made contact <laughs> in ways that we can't do right now. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, physical contact too. Oh, uh, th there were things that were sensory uh, deprivation and then totally um, used all your senses. So those are the kind of things that, uh, that some of these immersives have done, these, or as Carl would say, uh, experimental. Um, you know, immersive doesn't quite touch on it because yeah. there's well, so these, much going the on. The terms are, yeah, yeah, are not always precise. I, it just seems like that that is a strain of Pittsburgh work from real time to mm -hmm. bricolage to quantum. Again, they're not all the same, but there's this idea of the city being part of the, the theater in a way. Like, if, like I was going to ask the question of, of all of you wh how, how Pittsburgh enters into the work. I know the plays aren't always about Pittsburgh per se, unless they're by August or somewhere. But Pittsburgh is a, is a, is a theme and as a, as a canvas uh, for the work. It just seems, again, there are other, there are other immersive, immersive theaters everywhere and, and whatever you call it, site-specific is all over the country, but it feels like there's this uniquely Pittsburgh thing. And I think maybe Carl, Carl has something to say about that. Pittsburgh is, ri is rich to provide, but I'm gonna say something else. I think what's cool about Pittsburgh, I mean, I'm on my soapbox again. Pittsburgh has supported mid-sized organizations right, the growth and development of mid-sized organizations, with, which city um, certainly is, I think uh, in its soul, although cities larger, connects to that, and it, 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 it has spent a long time as a mid-sized organization, if now it is large. So I hand it to our town for recognizing innovation, for supporting it, for having a populace that will not just go to the Benetton Center or the Pittsburgh Public Theater, and we're very grateful for those, those institutions, but for doing something a little different. And that makes for a different community that has so much more go going for it, I think. That mid-sized sweet spot, and it's a very difficult place to occupy. You know, you do have a payroll you gotta meet. You, you have fixed expenses. You are planning two years out and have to commit contractually two years out. So you have to have support, you know, and you have to count on it, and you don't have giant audiences from a commercial perspective. So it's a difficult, but incredibly valuable thing to any community. No, no. Um, so it's not just the city, it's the city support, but also there are, are not a commercial audience, but there are audiences that have really responded as well, right? Okay. Um, yeah, the, the, I just saw the real time uh, a breakout session. They t they had Sanford Mark Barnes, who was in their Saints tour, said there was something in the dirt in Braddock. There must be something about that place that infused that work. And I just feel like that's something I, I hear, a theme I'm hearing a lot about. Now I know the city theater's dark right now, right? Or no? Oh, it's, uh, but the season doesn't start till September, right? Uh, well, yeah. I, you know, <laughs> you say we're dark, and I'm like, no, somebody's <laughs> there right now. <laughs> Okay, sorry, yeah, sorry. We had, we had two shows well, last tell me, night. Tell me what's going on there now. <laughs> but we are, um, you know, we're in our summer hiatus moment as far as producing okay, on right, our stage. Right. But we have opened our doors, um, you know, as, as every company is looking for uh, substantial and sustainable revenue streams. And the fact that we have two theaters on our campus, knowing that for a few months they'll sit empty. We have always, uh, City Theater has always opened the doors in the summer to allow community organizations and theater companies to rent our space, to use our facilities and resources to produce, um, and to not necessarily take on the burden of that heavy lift of uh, the, the spirit of the entrepreneur, you know, lives, is vibrant in this city. 
but the resources aren't necessarily always there. So to have a building that we own and to have rehearsal space, we are uh, privileged and grateful to open our doors to many uh, other companies who deserve to be seen and deserve to have a space uh, to have their voices heard in the community. So while we finished the season, and I will, I'm so grateful that we were able to get through our entire season, six full productions in addition to our ancillary productions, but we only had to cancel one performance, just one show due to COVID, and that is due to the staff at City Theater ensuring that our artists and that our community and that our audiences were safe to come through our doors and to produce on a level in which safety came first, the people came first, the human came first. And if we got to the point where the show did not need to go on, then it did not go on. And uh, that's what I'm very proud of. So we may be taking, you know, we may be sitting down for a little bit, <laughs> hardly, but uh, we're ready to, you know, start revving that train up again in the uh, fall. I'm curious because Pittsburgh has so many incredible, you know, arts education programs, specifically, you know, the universities, uh, and like this is the the place to study or or one of the places to study. I, I'm curious, you know, uh, how do your theaters, you know, work with students or or with those pro, uh, with those schools? Is there any kind of collaboration there? Well, like Montez uh, in Baltimore, we start them young here. Um, um, uh, certainly for musical theater, you know, um, you can be born into CLO Academy almost. There are so many places like that. Uh, we have great artists who have coaching um, studios whose uh, uh, young artists go on um, from here. Uh, and and uh, those programs um, are, are just amazing. And Every theater, uh, major theater here, has uh, has some sort of education program. I'll say that uh, even the small, I, I mentioned Front Porch before. Again, it's just two, uh, uh, two musicals in the summer, but as part of their mission and their financial mission is uh, internships, paid internships uh, for young people coming out of these colleges like Point Park and Carnegie Mellon. They're all, it's hyper-local. And uh, I'll mention the first time I ever saw Nathan Saulstone, who is currently doing Knox, uh, Knoxville, I think that's the Flaherty uh, Aaron's musical. Um, and uh, his first Broadway show was uh, Harry Potter and the Cursed Child. He was right out of Carnegie Mellon onto their stage. You see that a lot here. Um, so uh, yeah, we nurture them uh, uh, quickly. And, and that's uh, totally... Um, uh, a benefit of having theaters that uh, with caring and uh, robust education programs. So. I, I don't think I, I I know that Quantum could not make its work without Carnegie Mellon University, Point Park University, and and Pitt and Robert Morris and you know all kinds of amazing people come from the smaller universities as well. But but those major institutions, especially CMU and Point Park, have just provided an amazing elevation at every level, designers, directors, performers. Um, and I, I keep my audition files from the dark ages, and they have the most amazing faces in them. Danae Benton, you know, Joe Manganello, you know, you name it, they're in there from, from those days. And also, I think we're all committed to uh, educating in our ways young people in our town. So we also have great education programs at the companies. I know City Theater does, so does Quantum. I've modeled mine after City Theaters. Uh, yeah, that's what I wanted to hit on, is the fact that you know, educational theater and uh, looking inside of the uh, theater companies and seeing all of the great educational work going to the students, not just offering a, a matinee and allowing the students to come and engage in a talk back but being inside of their communities, in their classrooms. Uh, I was the education director at Quantum for about five years. And so, um, and that was in, uh, such an enriching experience for me because it allowed us to let the students tell their stories. So at Quantum, you go in and you take the prompt, you know, you tell them what the play is about, look at the themes, and then the students in turn go in, okay, this is how I interpret that and I'm gonna write this story out that's so rich 
full of uh, innovation, full of their experiences in which, you know, you'll see the cherry orchard in a way you <laughs> never expected to see. So I think that not only on the university level, but also looking inside of elementary and junior high or middle schools, we are inside of those uh, institutions and you'll find that those students flock to the theater. They sit inside of the theater, they're engaged and they are inspired because a lot of times they're seeing their instructors on the stages as well, which is so important to know that you're being taught by viable people mm. and being taught by people who are walking the walk and not just talking the talk. That's great. I want to open it for questions in a second if you want to think of one. I have one last question for you all. And this has been a great uh, overview uh, introduction to Pittsburgh theater. It sounds like, as you said, Sharon, there's a lot of different, it, 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 for almost every taste here. But I want to challenge you to ask you, what, what, what is missing? What would you like to see next? What would you like to see more of in this town? What kind of theater or what kind of commitment? It could be positive, but just want to ask that. Well, one of the things that may be does or doesn't go along with that mm -hmm. is I, I worry about um, sustainability mm -hmm. because there is so much theater going on and we talk about, you know, dis it, even in the spirit of collaboration, the, the fight for audience, mm -hmm. there's that, there's, uh, and, and despite all of the education programs, you know, I, I look around, our, uh, we're looking for younger to build new audiences, that's so difficult. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I, I I think that's the thing. I, you know, because so many kids are even coming, you're coming out of college. If they're not going to make it somewhere else right away, let's start a theater. Uh, it is uh, because oh, foundation. Um, the, these foundations have been here for so long. They'll they'll support us. I think that uh, a gathering to figure out a, a sustainability model um, that works for the established theaters and how to bring along new people uh, is is got to come. There's just so much foundations can do. Mm -hmm. There's just so much um, corporations will do. Uh, and uh, the patronage is just not there all the time. I'd like to see perhaps, um, you know, I don't know how sustainable it is to see a theater in the cultural district uh, do five performances a week instead of a certain number because half of those uh, performances have less than half filled um, uh, theaters. And what can you do with the theater when that's the case? You know, do you, can you bring in, you know, and I know so many of them do bring in full classes or whatever. Just to me, the, the thing I worry about is, is the population uh, to support and and the money to support all of the theater we have here, mm -hmm. and uh, sustainable models, which is is a really hard thing I think these days. So. Well, I have a list, but <laughs> and that's not necessarily you know a bad list. It's mm -hmm. a list because uh, I believe in Pittsburgh and that we can achieve it. Mm -hmm. And if I didn't think so, then I wouldn't bother to make the list. <laughs> um, but uh, diversity in the wings, diversity, and not just you know physically in the wings, but looking at our design teams and the um, education that comes along with understanding that for many marginalized groups, going through formal education training is not an option. Um, and so therefore, how do we as companies provide that training for those groups? Um, so I would love to see those design teams be as diverse as possible, not just by race, but in so many different ways in which we are all different. Um, black women. I would like to see shows written for black women, designed by black women, directed by black women, and starring black women of different ages. We, we have a deficit of that population in the arts in Pittsburgh, and we need to start catering to them and and that is another uh, sort of goal of mine as well you know especially as city theater is how do we uh meet that community figure out what are the roadblocks and the obstacles because there's so many talented people here but are we making sure that they have the proper child care so that they can do eight shows a week 
so that they are bringing in comparable you know, paychecks into their homes for sustainability. Um, another thing I want to see is for this conference to happen locally, for us to get together and not just at opening night party and throwing back some wine and pizza, but to like really get together and to look at the issues, to look at the good, to look at the success, and to look at where we can grow. Because uh, we shouldn't necessarily have to do it in front of a national audience. <laughs> we should be doing it in front, in front of the audiences that really uh, support us, give us their hard-earned money, and give us their time and support. So we owe it to those audiences to galvanize, come together, to learn, to understand, and to grow as one theater community. Wow. Beautifully said by my two colleagues. <laughs> That's pretty much it, right? That's the room. Okay. Uh, we want to open up to questions if anyone's got them. I think we could run around with the mic. Um, you want to do that? Okay. If anyone's got questions, please just come forward. I'm just saying thanks. <laughs> Thank you. Sharon, the journalist has a question. Yeah. Um, actually, for those of you who aren't from Pittsburgh, is there robust um, performing arts coverage in your towns, and what's your relationship with um, the media in your towns? Is there anybody here who um, uh, w can speak to that, or? Yeah, definitely, want, that's a topic, uh, that's a topic for its own panel. In fact, we were gonna do a panel about that, yeah, but uh, <laughs> the state of arts coverage. Hi, my name is Kelly. I'm from Second Generation Theater in Buffalo, New York. We're a small 10-year-old uh, company run by two people. Um, our arts coverage is seeing a really similar issue. It went from being relatively robust from the Buffalo News, three to four reviewers on staff. They'd get to opening night of everything and promptly turn around a review. Um, and there are those patrons who are, you know, our fair weather patrons who just look for four stars. And if they see four stars, they're going. And if they don't, they're not. So um, during the pandemic, it has cut down significantly. We're down to, I think, two major reviewers at that main paper. Um, you may or may not get reviewed. You know, there's no guarantee. It may be the second weekend, and your show only runs three weekends, so that's not really doing you a service. But we do have some online publications, sort of like, like it seems what you've created. We have Welcome 716 and Buffalo Theater Guide, where typically those reviews are coming out as well. Um, but I don't know if this is true. In Pittsburgh, we're finding that a lot of our younger patrons are millennials, and I don't even know what they're called. Everybody who's not a boomer, so <laughs> is sometimes more interested in what their peers have to say rather than what the experts have to say, right? So we are seeing that a lot of those tried and true patrons are um, not coming in as often because of the lack of, review, of reviews. It's not, not just Pittsburgh, but we're trying to sort of pivot it to peer reviews. Like, what did you think? Why are your peers going to want to come back? So we're doing our best to combat the problem that way. Thank you. Uh, my name is Jonathan Norton. I'm from uh, Dallas, Texas. I'm the playwright in residence at the Dallas Theater Center. And uh, uh, prior to COVID, we most in Dallas mainly, we just had two, uh, two major avenues uh, for arts coverage in our city, uh, which was the Dallas Morning News um, and this uh, online publication, which was actually um, uh, Theodore Jones, yeah, which offered like a really amazing, robust coverage of the entire uh, DFW uh, theater, dance, music, uh, and film scene. Um, and so those are our primary uh, outlets. And um, given uh, uh, the size of the, the arts community uh, in Dallas, 
I think it was largely between the two of those. Um, they served the community fairly well. However, uh, post-pandemic, uh, we've lost Theodore Jones, which is absolutely devastating uh, uh, to the community uh, in so many different kinds of ways, especially uh, largely for like small and mid-sized uh, organizations, especially because the coverage in, because Theodore Jones is the coverage that they could most reliably count on, more so perhaps than maybe the Dallas Morning News. Uh, and it was also through that coverage, and also coverage from the morning news, uh, where uh, arts groups were able to um, generate uh, enough, um, uh, I guess, uh, pu publicity or knowledge about their company, not, so just, not just so much for audience development, but also just in, in terms of, of being able to um, kind of develop the, uh, the promotional uh, and critical kind of collateral that was useful in grants and funding. And uh, so with the loss of Theodore Jones and with the morning news, uh, we lost, um, they let our, the, the chief theater critic go. And so they replaced her with a critic who I think his primary focus was film, I believe. And he's a great guy, he's a wonderful guy, and he's really supportive of the theater community. Uh, but even even with that, his coverage and the amount of coverage that uh, the morning news allows for the arts is so, so incredibly limited compared to what it was previous. And on top of that, it's oftentimes, you know, not reviews, not that reviews are the end all be all of everything, obviously, but again, they are useful for like funding. Yeah. I just want to say quickly, so Mark Lowry was my hero. Who's he my was, hero, too. <laughs> yes. He's the founder of um, Theater Jones and established over an 11-year period not only um, a foundation and corporate-supported website for the performing arts for all of North Texas, but he paid professionals to write, which really... Um, so I think that's another really good point, because we, yeah, we have yeah. other... Mm -hmm. um, uh, Kind of outlets in the community that that do uh, that review shows, but in terms of um, uh, kind of the critical dexterity or rigor yeah. of that is often, eh, you yeah. know. So, well, well, but also really quickly, uh, the reason I left and I'm working towards something else is that there's nobody behind me. There are no new voices. Um, there are no uh, BIPOC or LBGTQ people who have voices, who are getting opportunities, and this is something we're working on. We're working on creating a mentorship program, uh, talking to the foundation community here. But your voices really matter when people come forward and say, we have this thought, we want to have partnerships. So uh, I, I'll be talking to some of you <laughs> um, uh, soon, but I, I just was really interested to see and, and how sad it is because not only do we help specific uh, productions, I think n nothing chronicles the history of theater like the people covering it. No one says when Thoroughly Modern Millie is coming in, the problem with yellow face and how they've tried to fix that and what, you know, those sort of things um, are, are not happening. Or, or, or what August Wilson meant when he said, I am the blues and he's from Pittsburgh and we say, hey, August Wilson, but maybe, you know, uh, there are reasons that, that he felt that way. Um, so these are really important uh, things in, in my life. So thank you for sharing. I appreciate that. Yeah, especially uh, in an ephemeral art form like theater, it couldn't be more crucial to coverage, any kind of coverage. I feel like American theater can do our part. We can't be in every city. We can barely be in New York at this point, but no, we're, 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 we're around. Um, and I want to just make this plug again for, you know, uh, thanks for being at this, but, and this is also going out to our podcast listeners to please join TCG, because that's how, that's how we do this, this work um, of arts journalism. I wonder specifically to bring it back to Pittsburgh, whether that has affected your work, Montez and Carla, uh, the decline in coverage or the, or the kind of coverage that you get? Um, well, I guess it hasn't affected the work uh, because sometimes it is good to just do your work, <laughs> you know, and to not necessarily 
have to worry about, oh, gosh, on Thursday. Because <laughs> <laughs> I'm, uh, yes, I did. Oh yes, <laughs> but um, but uh, you know the idea of uh, sometimes putting the words uh, and the work in the company into the world and speaking for yourself. And so Sharon brought up the point that uh, City Theater we uh, uh, started a podcast called City Speaks, in which we are internally communicating what's happening inside of our organization uh, to the world, and also sort of bringing on people to give their opinions about what we're doing and our initiatives that we have in place as well. So um, in some cases, we, you know, some companies have taken the uh, sort of the advertising of their theater and put it into their own hands in a different way, in a different marketing strategy. And uh, there were times, there was even at one point where we said, well, maybe we actually don't allow certain people to review our work. And that's a radical stance in a in a industry that is reliant on word of mouth. <laughs> and what do you what do you mean when you put your values, you know, where you live, and say we actually we don't agree with the politics of your organization? So therefore, you cannot come and review us. You do not have the appropriate clientele to review this uh, show, which is based on people of color's lives and experiences. How do you make the? How do you draw those lines? And it's easy to do. You just have to stay. The hard part is standing behind it and doing the work to go into those communities to make sure that those stories are being seen by who uh, they represent. So um, I've always been grateful to the Pittsburgh media. Uh, they've been instrumental in my career because I mean, no matter if they mispronounce my name or not, <laughs> it at least put it in print, and it and not just me, but. Uh, colleagues and so many other folks who wouldn't have the opportunities if folks didn't see their names. Seeing and saying someone's name is extremely important. Mm -hmm. um, but it doesn't mean that it doesn't come with its caveats. It doesn't come with uh, its issues, its biases. You know, I think when I first got to Pittsburgh, it was this big thing where uh, reviews were almost like we used to do dramatic readings of them in the dressing room. <laughs> and because, you know, sometimes they'd be a little tough. They'd be a little scathing. So you had to find the fun in it a little bit. And so they've grown. And I think Sharon has, your touch as a uh, critic and as a writer has always been about the heart of the work. And you're a great judge of whether or not that heart is pure or <laughs> that heart is sort of, you know, contaminated a little bit. <laughs> but you're not there to talk about the lights didn't work. <laughs> and we've read those reviews. Right. <laughs> the lights didn't work. Well, have you looked inside the organization to see if they are getting the resources that they need to mm. make sure that the lights work mm. and that they're up to date? No. And therefore, this production is going to get a negative review because you couldn't see a certain side of the stage that you didn't probably need to see anyway. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and so... Talking about the real issues, the themes, and why it's important to the community, I think is the new role of theater critics, and not to necessarily bring down the work, but to lift up the experience. If you want. I just want to add that I think I'm a, I'm an idealist, so listen to. Montez, but I, I mean, we're a sports town. The engagement on what happened last night in sports, Sharon is a sports person, yeah. is so vibrant, and the arts deserve that kind of engagement. Mm. And also, criticism can give context. You know, like, I, as a young person, felt that my context was, you know, the, the greatest theater makers out there that I had access to. There were plenty that I didn't have access to, but I sought them, and I found myself in context with them for good or ill, and I felt I was in, an, in a dialogue with them about what theater might be, and criticism was the place where that came out of little me and my feelings and into my community. 
And I wish that for all theater and, you know, even the thing about the lights not being on, if that were in a public dialogue space where this company's great work deserves more resources so that their lights are on them, you know, the, the vacuum is not the answer. Great last word, Carla. Uh, the vacuum is not the answer. Uh, Sharon Montez, Carla, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you to the host committee in Pittsburgh and to all you for joining us for this special edition of Offscript. Thanks so much. Thank you. Uh, Nikki is going to kill me if I don't.